Mark, I want you to read chapter 7, Mark chapter 7, verse 1. Wait a minute, I want you to put this on. So put this on first. All right, now here you go, just right there. Yeah, start here, verse 1, now. Now. Yeah, go ahead. Now. No, you can't see? Okay, hold on, let's try something else. Here, take those off. Here, try these. He needs glasses. Okay, now read it. <laughs> Still not working? Well, no. you got any other glasses? You got anything else you could wear? Let me see here. Oh, yes. Here we go. Try those. Ah. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw this, that some of the, his disciples ate with him with hands that were defiled, that is unwashed. All right, let's give him a big hand. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. So that's silly. What's that all about? Well, um, you know, there's different kind of blindness, right? Like some people just can't see. They can't see anything. And it's not, you know, not their fault. They can't see anything. They're just blind. Um, but somebody once said, there are none so blind as... Yeah, somebody said that, Stan, but there's actually a better one than there are none so blind as those who can't see. Uh, there's another one that somebody said. There are none so blind as those who will not see. Uh, and and uh, in our text today, we are, we're talking about some religious leaders who are, are blind, not because they can't see. They're actually trying... They think they're trying to see. They're looking for God's word. They're looking for, for God's will. They're trying to make everybody keep God's will. So, so they have that in their minds, but they, they're refusing to see what God is doing because they have some other pair of glasses on. There's a pair of glasses they're wearing that won't let them see what they need to be able to see. And so, uh, and Mark actually, I think, gives a hint to at least us, I don't know if anybody got it at the time, but I think Mark's readers got it, and then uh, and we can get it. But it's weird because it's not in the English very well. Uh, the, the text says in the Greek, and I checked seven different Greek texts, and it says that what, what the Pharisees were angry about and the scribes were angry about is that Jesus' disciples literally were eating the loaves with unwashed hands. Now, my version doesn't even mention what they were eating. The NIV just says they were eating their food. I, maybe, maybe somebody, <laughs> maybe they didn't think it was important. But I want you to think about this. If you were an original audience of, of, of the Gospel of Mark, as it was circulating, and, and what they would do is a congregation like this, somebody would read it in a sitting. Now, we don't do that. We take a little chunk at a time, right? But if you were to hear it in a sitting and I was reading through the entire text for you. Just a, moment ago, just a moment ago, you would have heard me say that Jesus took the loaves and did what? Fed thousands of people, 5,000 5, people plus more with the loaves. And then collected up from the loaves 12 basketfuls of bread. And then you would have heard, just a moment after that, that when Jesus came walking on the water, the disciples were utterly amazed because they did not understand what? I told you last week. The loaves. That's what it says. They didn't understand the loaves. And in just a moment, you hear me saying, now the Pharisees and scribes came and said, and were upset with Jesus, and they said, your disciples are eating the loaves with unwashed hands. Now, I think Mark, I think he's giving us a foretaste, a hint of the blindness here. I mean, imagine this. Jesus has just fed a whole city's worth of people with some, a few loaves, five, five loaves and two fish. But all the Pharisees and scribes can see is that these guys are eating probably the leftovers without washing their hands. I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? It's insane. But, but, 
I don't know why the English text, I mean, you get it in the American Standard, the, uh, the King, King James, will, any more of the more literal will give you the loaves there. I think they should have given it to us. It should be in there. The loaves are in view here. And, uh, but anyway, what's going to happen here is the Pharisees and scribes are going to come and they're going to basically sort of accuse Jesus and attack Jesus and say, your disciples are rule breakers and your disciples are defiling themselves. And Jesus is going to sort of do what we always did as kids when somebody attacked us verbally. We said, I'm rubber and you're glue. You know the rest of that? Bounce off me and stick to you. Now, he doesn't do it in a juvenile way. He does it in a powerful way. But it's basically what he's going to do. By the end of our text today, he's going to have said, no, it's not my disciples who are breaking the rules. It's, it's, it's basically you guys. And he's going to say, no, they're not defiled. You guys are defiled. And he won't say it to them. It's in, some, it's in some things he says to his disciples. It's really them. They're the ones defiled. But we're going to see all that. But let's begin by reading the, the, the uh, accusation of the, the scribes and Pharisees. So chapter 7 of Mark. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is unwashed. Literally it says, the loaves. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly holding to the tradition of the elders, and when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and scribes ask him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Okay, let's understand what's actually going on here. The, the, uh, the scribes and Pharisees, they're not coming and saying that your disciples are breaking the law. They're not saying that, right? They're not saying they're breaking the law. What are they saying? The traditions of the elders, okay? They're breaking the tradition of the elders. Now, specifically, they're not washing their hands, okay? Now, how do you come up with the tradition of the elders? For one, these traditions are not all bad, I mean, I kind of agree with the washing of the hands thing, especially for potlucks and, and, and uh, buffets, right? Uh, washing hands is a good idea. So, so this, these, uh, these traditions of the elders that they violated, uh, coming up with those is, is not necessarily a bad idea. If, if, uh, if you know that the law says if you touch something defiled, if you touch something unclean, then you need to go through a certain ritual cleansing before you, know, you eat or participate with other people. And so it's kind of a good rule, especially if you go to the marketplace, as he mentions. Because when you're in the marketplace, you're around a lot of people, a lot of stuff that people touch. They didn't have hand sanitizer back then, right? How many go to Disneyland and have that little pocket hand sanitizer? Yeah, you don't want to get sick, use that stuff, right? Uh, but they didn't have that. So it's a good idea to, to wash right, after being in the marketplace. And, and because you can never know who touched what, just always do it. And, and we like that rule. Hey, wash your hands before you eat. We like that rule. It's a good rule. But Jesus does not take them to task about that specific rule. He doesn't argue with them about whether it's a good idea to wash hands or not. He takes the entire tradition. He takes the system of the traditions of men that they have. And he basically is going to say, uh, your traditions as a whole completely violate God's law. That's, watch what he says. He's going to say that. Okay. So I'm going to skip his, uh, Jesus' uh, sort of quoting Isaiah against them and just jumping down to verse 8. He says, you, right? They said, hey, Jesus, your disciples are rule breakers. Jesus says, you leave the commandment of God. You leave it in order to do what? In order to hold to your own traditions. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. Whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you've gained from me is Corban, 
that is, devoted to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition handed down. And many such things do you do. <laughs> Listen, they're upset because the disciples broke one of their traditions. Anybody know where the particular uh, honor your father and mother is located? The Ten Commandments. The, the big ones. <laughs> Jesus is like, you guys are nuts. You're complaining that my disciples you know, may have touched something unclean and, and maybe should have done a ritual cleansing. You're breaking the Ten Commandments. And many such things you do. Now that's crazy, right? It's kind of weird to think of that these people who were so intent on keeping God's word could be so far off track, right? I mean, aren't you glad that doesn't happen today? I mean, do you think that kept going on in history, that religious people continued to do that? 500 years ago, there was a guy named William Tyndale who thought it was a good idea to be like the Bereans and search the scriptures daily to see what was true. We like that, don't we? And so he was trying to get the Bible in the common man's language because they couldn't read the one they had. And the church burned him at the stake. I've looked and I cannot find it in my Bible. I can't find anywhere it says, if you make the Bible that, so people can read it, that you should be burned at the stake. Did that come from the law? Did it come from the New Testament? Where did it come from? Somebody's reason conclusion. Somebody decided, hey, people, regular old people are not supposed to read the scriptures. Let's kill them. That's what God wants us to do. He said, well, you know, Randy, you know, that, that historic Western, you know, Roman Catholic church, they were a mess anyway. Everybody, everybody knows it. Okay, maybe. There was a guy named Michael Servetus. This guy was... Uh, expert in many sciences. Um, and he was a physician, the first European to correctly identify and describe the pulmonary uh, system. This is a great guy, amazing mind. He was a theologian who also had a lot of contact with the Moors or the Muslims down uh, in Spain and around the Mediterranean. And he brought this issue to the church because the Muslims were saying we don't like, besides other reasons, we don't like Christianity because you guys are polytheists. And, and you should be monotheists. And, and it's because of the way the Trinity was described, the Muslims were getting the idea that the Christians were polytheists. And so Michael Servetus went to the, was saying to the church, we need to have a, a dialogue about the Trinity so we can describe it in a way that people don't think we're polytheists. So they condemned him. And so, instead of getting burned at the stake, he fled. He fled to Geneva, where there was this sort of Protestant experiment going on, where Geneva was uh, the, sort of the church, and it was run by John Calvin. John Calvin, Reformation leader. He was going to run things here. Back to the Bible movement. Let's do things by the Bible. He appealed to John Calvin, who promptly had him burned at the stake. Is that in the New Testament? Is that anywhere in the Bible? Where do you get that from? Traditions of men. It's not that all traditions are bad. Traditions can be good. But when the traditions somehow circle around and destroy what God is actually trying to say, that's bad. Does that go on today? Before I talk about that, I want to look at Jesus' the rest of his answer, the second part of his answer about, about what's clean. Because he not only tells them, it's you guys. He, he actually says that very forcefully. You guys are the ones who break God's law. And you do it a lot. But then he deals with the clean cleanliness thing. So he says in verse 14, And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. 
Now, the first thing I want to ask you is, did you hear a parable? I mean, a parable is like, you know, there's a field and there's a pearl and a guy sold everything he had to get the field so he'd get the pearl. That's a parable. Because we're not talking about fields and pearls, are we? The reality is we're talking about the kingdom and a relationship with God and, and you know, you have to give up some things to, get, to be able to ha- experience those things. Uh, parable is like there's, a, there's, there's a, a mustard seed and he plants it and it becomes a big giant bush or a tree in the garden, right? That's a parable because you're not really talking about mustard seeds and you're not talking about trees. What are you talking about? You're talking about faith, probably, and growing and becoming useful and way more than you ever started. Those are parables. I didn't read a parable here. I read a statement that Jesus said. Jesus said, There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. That's a statement, not a parable. Why would the disciples ask him about the parable? Because it made no sense to them. Because the law clearly talks about things that defile. I had bacon and shrimp yesterday. I was not worried about being defiled. So when I read those words, they do not strike me. They do not make me wonder and think and they don't confront me. Those words are as common as anything to me. Because I don't worry about what I eat because my religion taught that it doesn't matter what I eat. Because Jesus said it. But, but what did their religion teach? What did the law say about eating things that were unclean? You, you can't do that. That makes you unclean. You can't eat shrimp or lobster or, or pork. All the good stuff. You can't eat that. And so the disciples, they could not believe it literally. They didn't understand it. And so they came to Jesus because, because they're saying, Jesus, that's crazy. That's crazy talk. So they said, can you tell us this parable? And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? And the answer is yes. (laughs) Because he didn't tell them a parable. He he told them the truth. But how did he reason this truth? How did he come to this conclusion? How did Jesus decide it doesn't matter what you eat, what goes into your body? He gives his reasoning right here. He says, do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Why? Since it enters not his heart. Yeah, but but that's not what the law said. Yeah. Jesus has a different pair of glasses. It doesn't enter the heart. Okay, well, hold on. Yeah, if you didn't have bacon and shrimp and cake... It's going to ruin your heart. That's true. Now we're not talking literally about the heart. We're talking figuratively about the heart. So be careful with bacon, not because it makes you unclean, but it will mess you up if you eat too much. But Jesus is looking at even the law through the glasses of the heart. Even the law. And in some way he's saying, those things the law said, and they had a purpose at the time, but you need to understand, right now, what God cares about is not about what you eat. Because that doesn't change or affect your relationship with God. Unless you eat so much bacon, you die. But God cares about what's in your heart. And nothing you eat can affect spiritually your heart. This is Jesus' glasses. And then he says, thus he de- oh, Mark tells us, thus he declared all foods clean. Mark had to tell us that because nobody could believe it when he said it. <laughs> but Mark has to tell us he did that. And then Jesus said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, and four more. 
Now, let me say this. All of the first nine of those, I think everybody there would say, yeah, yeah, that stuff's a mess and that'll, that's, that'll wreck your relationship with God. Don't live in that kind of stuff. I think everybody would agree to that. But it's these last four that are very interesting to me. Four in a row. Does anybody know when, uh, when Pilate said he knew why the Jews had delivered Jesus up? Anybody know what the reason was? It, it's like jealousy. Envy. Envy. The text says, for Pilate knew is because of envy that the, the religious leaders delivered Jesus up. What do you call it when somebody calls the Son of God, who's doing all kinds of wonderful things, the servant of Satan? What do we call that in legal terms, I guess? It might be liable, but anyway, isn't it slander? Aren't you slandering somebody, making false accusations? Um, in the next chapter, uh, Jesus is going to tell his disciples, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. What does he mean by that? Is he really talking about yeast and bread? Paul says to the Corinthians, your boasting is not good. Don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? What's the problem with leaven? It just puffs up. Leaven just puffs stuff up. What do the Pharisees teaching do? Just puffs people up. What do we call puffed up people? Prideful. Envy. Slander. Pride. In, uh, in Matthew 23, Jesus calls, well, the religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees, a lot of names, actually. But one of them is fools. He calls them fools. I can't hold up that last finger. It doesn't work. There. He calls them fools. Look at the last four here of what makes people unclean. After sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. I think to Mark's readers, that's an indictment. It's an indictment on these religious leaders who are destroying the law of God because they're wearing these glasses. They'll never be able to see. They're not even seeing this. But they'll never be able to see this. They can't see through these glasses as long as they're wearing those. So, what about today? Um, so here's the thing. Uh, are we burning people at the stake? No. Now, some people might feel like Christians do that. Um, but, but we're not. We're not burning people at the stake. Um, but, but remember... The religious leaders attacked Jesus' disciples because of, 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 of a tradition that really wasn't, you know, a bad idea. Go ahead and wash your hands. That's a good, good idea. But it was the system that was the problem. The system of reason conclusions becoming so important, like that they are the word of God, that they not only destroy what God says, but they completely destroy this. So what do we got in our, in our fellowship? Well, I, I'm about to say something to you that, and I think I've said it before, but maybe, maybe uh, you went deer in the headlight when I said it before, so I'll say it again. Um, so there, there are some things that uh, we've kind of grown up with that we talk about that are, you know, they seem benign enough, uh, we use phrases like worship services. We do, right? I don't see anything wrong with calling an assembly a worship service. Unless you're a thus saith the Lord kind of person, because our assemblies are never called worship services in the Bible. And if that's shocking, then check me on that. Get your phone out, do a word search, do a phrase search. And see if you can find where any assembly in the New Testament is called a worship service. Okay? You won't find it. And the things we do are called acts of worship. Things we do we call acts of worship. I don't see any problem with calling things acts of worship. You can do that if you want. Don't make somebody else do that, but you can do it. Uh, but unless you're a thus saith the Lord kind of person where you have to have something written in the Bible, because guess what? Nothing we do when we get together, is ever called an act of worship in the Bible. Did you know that? It's not. It's not called acts of worship. It's not called a worship service. Well, so what? How is that a problem? Well, doing that is not a problem. The problem comes 
when, when you go from describing an assembly as a place where the body of Christ is built up and edified and encouraged and, and lifted up and energized, like the Bible describes it, when you go from that to saying it's a worship service, now you've changed something. Because now, if you and I disagree about something, I've changed the worship service. If we disagree about something, I may be violating God's authorized pattern of worship service. And we know what happens to people who do that. We read about Nadab and Abihu. In fact, many of you grew up with stories about Nadab and Abihu because somebody changed something in the worship service. We have our authorized acts of worship. We have our worship service. And it's exactly the way God said we ought to do it, which is weird because it's never mentioned in the New Testament. So what I'm saying is, our way of talking about what we do is in this genre. It's here. Now, why is that important? Most of our church's divisions have been over these things. What is an authorized worship service? Who's allowed to do what? Who can perform the acts of worship? When are they performed? How often are they performed? Do you use one cup or many cups, right? Uh, what kind of music do you have? Who can serve the communion? Who can wait on the tables? Most of our divisions come from the things that we, the rules that we've decided are here. And yet these are not in here. They're not. They're here. And so, effectively, we've done this. Over this, how are we any different than the Pharisees? All the people hurt in church divisions and destroyed by church breakups and all of that done in the name of our traditions. What did Jesus say the night before he was betrayed? He said, he prayed, Father, I want all who believe in me to be one as we are one. Jesus said in describing what his, how people would know who his church is, who his disciples are, remember what he said? By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And here's my command. Love one another. Paul told the church, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Jesus wants us to wear these glasses. We've been wearing these glasses and we've been destroying people and churches. Not you and me, but in Christianity. Not just our tradition, but I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about us. Jesus wants us to wear these glasses. Because they're the only thing that's going to let people know he's present. Fighting and arguing about things that have to do with our reasoned conclusions. Jesus is not happy with that. There's only one pair of glasses we have to wear if we want to see truly, and that is, that's love. Will you pray with me? Holy Father, I pray this message will reach our hearts. I, I know it sounds as radical as maybe what Jesus said about eating foods that don't make unclean. Except the difference is, this message isn't changing what's in the scripture. It's, it's revealing it. Help us, Father, to understand Jesus' passion. Help us to be able to see through his glasses. Help us to understand that love has to be the foundation of our dealings, even with those who disagree about all kinds of things, whether it's in the law or out of the law. Humble our hearts. Rejuvenate our spirits. Help us to find the freedom you give us in love. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.